So I recently did a video where I went through some board style orthopedic surgery questions and received a pretty good response from that. A lot of people were interested in knowing what do the questions look like to an orthopedic surgery resident or someone who's about to be board certified as an orthopedic surgeon. It takes four years of college, four years of medical school, five years of surgery training to become an orthopedic surgeon. And before that, you have to take a series of exams. Every year while you are a resident, you take an eight hour exam. It's called an in-training exam to help you prepare for your boards. At the completion of your orthopedic surgery residency program, you actually take a eight to nine hour exam about everything in orthopedics from histology to pathology, anatomy, physiology, approaches. There may be some chemistry on there, some physics, different equations that you have to know, bio stats, all this other <laughs> crazy stuff. In this video today, we're going to go over some board style questions. It's been about six months since I took and passed my boards. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put it right up here. But we're going to go through some of these questions and let's see uh, how much of this stuff I actually forgotten. I'm pretty sure that uh, a lot of that stuff, as soon as I got my results on my boards, went in this ear, went in that ear, and I forgot about it. So let's go over some board style questions for orthopedic surgery. So OrthoBullets is the website that we use as a resource to study while we are residents. And there are some Q banks on here that we use to study. So we're gonna create a personal test here. As you can see, I've already taken a lot of these and I'm just gonna keep this the same state. And then specialty wise, we're gonna keep it the same, all the uh, disciplines. We're gonna do, let's say five questions. We're gonna do a learning mode so they can give us explanation. We can figure out right away whether I got the question right or not. So here we go. 59 year old man, acute pain radiating down the neck. Oh, it's a spine question, cool. I'm pretty sure I should get this right. So this gentleman has pain radiating down the neck down the right upper extremity. He has tricep weakness, decreased triceps reflex, diminished sensation in the middle finger. A cervical disc herniation most likely found at what level? So usually when there's a long paragraph in the question stem, I usually go to the last sentence. A cervical disc herniation most likely be found at what level? If I can answer the questions, usually there are five or six different answers. If I can answer it with that particular last sentence, I will do that. A lot of times on our boards and a lot of tests that you take, there's gonna be a lot of information in the paragraph that is useless. So first thing I usually do and what I did on my boards is I jump down straight to that last sentence and I try to see if I can answer it. But in this question, what you need to know, you need to know your anatomy. This is like a level three, level four question. It's not like, hey, what is the largest city in the state of Texas? This is, you have to know the largest city and you have to be able to apply that to a particular clinical vignette. So this gentleman has pain radiating his right upper extremity. He has tricep weakness. I know the triceps is C7 and diminished sensation in his middle finger. So this is C6. These are C7, C8. So it's most likely the C6, C7 level getting the seven nerve root. And they give you an explanation here, illustration. You can see in the cervical spine, the five, six level, the six nerve root comes out here. So C6 is biceps flexion, wrist extension. Uh, C5 is also biceps and also deltoid. So you have to know your anatomy to answer these questions. All right, pretty easy uh, question kind of starting off. Wow, I probably don't, we're gonna probably guess on this. Absence of the enzyme glucocerebrosidase, it's a big word, leads to what clinical entity? I kind of remember this. Uh, a lot of you guys probably can get this question right. What I usually do if I don't know the answer, I'll start eliminating things. I know it's not Tay-Sachs. I know it's not Krabby's disease. 
Newman picks maybe Fabry's disease. It's either Gaucher's or Newman picks disease. We're going to go with uh, Gaucher's. And that is the correct answer. Wow, I got that right. So a process of elimination. You start eliminating things that you can eliminate. And these are some typical x-rays that you see in these patients. Erlen Meyer flask. You can see how this, these bones kind of shape like a flask. And that usually gives it away if they give you an x-ray and they say, hey, what is this particular condition here? So let's go to the next question. So I'm gonna read the last sentence first. Which treatment will most likely give him the best outcome? So I really can't answer the question without knowing the rest of the stuff above that. You can look at the x-rays also. A lot of times these things are not really helpful. They may just give you an x-ray and you don't need that to answer the question. So it's this is an x-ray of the shoulder here. It shows a lot of osteophytes, which is extra bone, there's decreased joint space, there's sclerosis, which is means there's been some rubbing of the bone right at the joint here. There's also some interarticular kind of calcifications that I can see kind of right above the hemorrhoid head here. And then looking at the other x-ray, this is a CT scan that looks at the shoulder from the axial view. It shows a significant amount of arthritis. It, it shows some retroversion of the glenoid, which means that bone has been rubbing against that glenoid. The humeral head and the glenoid forms a socket and it articulates that way. There's a lot of degenerative changes at the biceps tending. So when you're reading these x-rays and CT scans, MRIs, that's how you should go through them. So this is a 65 year old man, progressive debilitating pain, crepitus in the shoulder. He has active forward elevation to 120 degrees, which is pretty good looking at his x-rays. And external rotation strength is normal. So they're asking what treatment will give him the best outcome in three years. So you have to know what the literature says about patients with arthritis of the shoulder. What treatment is going to give that patient the best outcome? And without even looking at the answer choices, I know by looking at his x-rays, he has good strength that tells me his rotator cuff tendon is intact. He has elevation of 120 degrees, which is pretty good for a 65 year old man. And the best treatment that will give him the best outcome is a total shoulder replacement. So when I'm going through the answer choices, I know what I'm looking for. And if it doesn't say total shoulder replacement, then my thought process may be off, but we're going to look for a total shoulder. So arthroscopic capsule release, that is something that I would not try as, you know, the first line of treatment, and that probably won't give him the best outcome. So even though I know what I think the answer may be, I still go through the remaining answers and make sure I eliminate everything. You don't want to jump to the answer that you think it may be and then go to the next question because it may be a trick question. I've been tricked that way several times and you don't want to fall for that. So think about what you think the best answer is in your head and then eliminate everything else just to confirm. So humeral head arthroplasty with glenoid bone grafting no, I don't think that's the best choice just because, you know, doing a bone grafting procedure in a 65 year old is probably not a good idea. Hemiarthroplasty versus reverse. They told you that his strength is normal and his external rotation. So a reverse total shoulder replacement is usually used when patients have rotator cuff pathologies where you put the glenoid ball in the socket kind of in opposite kind of directions to allow for more elevation of the shoulder. And the answer choices that I'm down to, hemiarthroplasty and total shoulder arthroplasty, and knowing what the literature says, because I've read articles about this, total shoulders actually do better. And that is the uh, answer here, and here's the explanation. So that's how I go through the questions. Even though I knew what I thought the answer may be, I still eliminated everything else. So the fourth question, Reamed femoral intermedullary nailing is associated with a higher rate of which of the following as compared to non-reamed nailing for distal femoral shaft fractures. 
So th there's studies that show that reaming, where we put a drill and we go down inside the bone to allow for a more cortical fit of that bone to get a better fit of the nail. We put a metal rod down the femur. Before we put the rod down, we can't just stick it down the bone and patients who their, their canal is very small, we have to ream it out with a reamer. So reamed femoral intermedullary nailing has a higher rate of what? It's not pulmonary complications. There's been multiple studies on that. It's not the need for a transfusion. It's not iatrogenic fracture, which means a fracture that's caused by something that you do. The answer is either malalignment or union. And for this question, I'm gonna go with union. I think if you ream, there's more blood flow that is applied to that area of the bone that may be broken and the patients may heal faster or heal better. So we're gonna go with the union. That's actually the uh, right answer. And it goes through some studies that they, uh, that shows that. Well, I'm actually doing pretty good for taking my board six months ago. During ACL reconstruction, divergence between the graft and screw fixation within the bone can lead to complications. Which of the following statements regarding graft screw divergence is true? So if you knew nothing about ACL surgery or graft screw divergence, which is the angle that the screw and the graft go into the bone, then you may not be able to answer this question. And I don't actually remember a lot about that particular aspect of ACL surgery. No, I do a little bit. But um, we're gonna go through these answers here. Risk of failure is eliminated using an accessory anteromedial drilling portal. That just means the different portals that we put on the skin, the different incisions, the angles that they're going into the skin. Uh, we'll leave that there just for now. Complications occur more commonly with soft tissue grafts. That's actually, you know, not really answering the question of the, that they're asking. So I'm gonna eliminate that. Loss of fixation becomes a greater risk if the graft screw divergence is greater than 30 degrees. That's, that sounds about true. Excessive graft screw divergence more commonly occurs on the tibial fixation. Uh, we're gonna eliminate that. I don't think that is actually true. Graft screw divergence is a common cause of late failure of ACL reconstructions. So keywords like this, this kind of tipped me off. It says late failure. That would, that's how they can get you. This could be early failure, which I think is actually the answer. So we're gonna eliminate that. I'm down to one or three. I have a 50% chance of getting this right. Hmm. We're gonna go with three, just because I think um, if your graft screw divergence is, let's say, 90 degrees, that's a lot of stress that's going to be applied to that graft and that screw. There's going to be some shearing forces, and that ACL is going to fail. So that's actually the correct answer. Graft screw divergence greater than 15 to 30 degrees from the trajectory of the femoral tunnel may lead to failure of fixation and early ACL failure. So actually... <laughs> quite surprising. I got all of these correct. I made 100%. And um, yeah, so I, I think I can take my boards again right now and still pass them. Probably not. So I just wanted to make this video to show you guys what the questions look like when you are an orthopedic surgery resident. When I was in college, I always wondered, what do the questions look like in medical school? What does a test look like? What are they asking? When I was in medical school, I always wanted to know what questions the residents are studying, what are they asking on these exams, and this video gives you some idea. It could be anything that they ask you, so you have to be prepared. You have to study day by day, day in, day out. Be ready for them asking you any variant of questions on whatever topic that they wanna talk about. So. The way to do well on any exam in your medical career is to do lots of questions. The more questions you do, the better and higher your score will be. I hope this video helped you guys and helped clarify what questions look like to orthopedic surgeons. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. We'll see you next time.